Hi everybody and big welcome to a Malifaux crew tutorial on how to play Wild Fire. So Kader's Wildfire just accidentally happens to be my favorite crew inside Malifaux. Now you can easily summarize the Wildfire with this. They are easily overpowered as long as you have lots of burning and access to pure markers. But once you don't, they are quite underperforming. If we, for example, take the fire branded model, one of the core minions for wildfire, it has promise to the flame, which basically gives it armor one as long as it's in within two inches of a peer marker. And you can use blaze of glory by lowering the burning condition by one, not ending the entire condition, just lowering it by one to get a bonus flip in any duel. So you could look at this model like a six soulstone model with armor one and bonus flips on every duel. That's really good, especially when you also have a 10 inch shoot attack and a heal that will usually heal for free every single time, which is by the way a bonus action. So you can do two shoot range attacks and then one heal or walk, shoot and then heal. But if it doesn't have any burning and you don't have a peer marker next to it, then it's a five move, defense five, four willpower, six health and that's it. It's very easily killed and it doesn't have a bonus action because its bonus action requires burning somewhere. This naturally means two things. The first one is that you're quite easily interacted with. If your opponents are able to remove the burning condition, that will weaken your models quite a lot, including if the opponent are also able to remove peer markers, marker removals, which is also something that is quite frequently existence of in this game. Then they can remove your access to burning, which means that you you will tire out eventually. The second thing, and in my opinion, wildfire is quite death poly because you want to move from peer marker to peer marker. Always have access to burning generation, more burning, more good, and also having access to peer markers. And there's a limit on how much peer markers you can spread out on the map, and there's a limit on how much you can move around these peer markers. So when you play Kairis, there's a natural progression of just moving all of the models together from peer marker to peer marker. And when it comes to playing Kairis Wildfire, everything resolves around solving those two issues. The part where people can interact with you easily, and the part where when you need to move from peer marker to peer marker. So let's begin by looking at model by model and talk about how they are part in solving that aspect. So Kairis 1 is very mobile, 6 move with flight, which means that she can move around quite easily. But also she has run and gun, which means that you can be quite effective in the mobility. You can move and shoot in one action. She has a very short range though of only Eight. So she needs to get a bit close to the enemy, but she's still quite durable with armor 1. And she also has the blaze of glory, which means that if an opponent attack you and you have burning, you can defend yourself with the burning condition by getting bonus flips to the defense flip. So she's absolutely a fighter. Also, she has the bonus action on the peer, creating that peer marker with a 12 inch range, which means that you can really help out spreading out your crew. You can say, okay, over there, far in the distance, that's where we're gonna go. But a very key ability on her is the third degree burns. If this model is the crew leader, enemy models treat peer markers as hazardous injured one in addition to any other hazard effect and are never considered unaffected by peer marker hazardous terrain traits. This means two things. First, your opponents can't be immune to your peer markers. They can't have counter models that just run over them and ignore them. The second thing is that you can stack up injured on a single model and make it really easy for your entire crew to just focus down that thing once they have like injured two or one, or maybe sometimes even climbing up to injured three. Kairis 2, the reborn is a lot different though. And some might ask, which one is stronger, Kairis 1 or Kairis 2? The answer is that they are very different, and they are good versus different kinds of crews. The big difference though is that Kairis 2 is better at producing more peer markers, however, with a shorter range. She can't throw out peer markers across the battlefield with a 12 inch range as the Kairis 1 has, it's more focused to her own 
crew, so to say. However, from a lot of playtesting, I've realized that Kairos 2 can spread out on the map more easily than Kairos 1, because the pure marker production of other models in the Wildfire crew is getting better by Kairos 2. You see, she has a very interesting ability, Burning Man's Gift. If this model is the crew leader, friendly wildfire models with burning three or more may add any suit to the final dual totals. If we look at Deacon Hellcrist, bonus action, call to the burning man. This is a self-heal, but with an inbuilt trigger from crows, drop a 50mm hazardous burning one peer marker into base contact with this model. Kairis 1 can't do that unless you're cheating fate or naturally flip into the card by luck. However, with Kairis 2, you can now spread out. Once you have some burning on Deacon Hellcris, he can run off on his own and spread peer markers wherever he goes. And that will help the Wildfire crew to spread out more as they might have different pathways that they can now go for. For example, Kairis, with her inbuilt trigger, also called to the Burning Man, can also, on her bonus action, create a peer marker who go in one direction, while Deacon Hellcris could go in another direction. That is a trick on how Kairis 2 is less death -bally. And the same thing can be said with Carlos Vascras. We're gonna get back to that model soon, but if you look right there on the peer bonus action, he doesn't have the inbuilt tome, which means you naturally have to flip into it or sheet fate, either being lucky. But with Kairis 2, you will always be able to create that peer marker from the bonus action. But a really big thing is that she is extremely AOE focused. If she starts her move from a peer marker with wings of fire, you will deal one damage to all models she moves through. With her seven inch move, it becomes a flight move if it begins from a peer marker. And because of Hand of Immolation's inbuilt, or not inbuilt, but basically inbuilt trigger, because you will always have three or more burning on the Kairis, so you will always be able to choose that Rampage, which means that if you fly over a peer marker, you will do Wings of Fire and also potentially Rampage damage as well. But also, all of her attacks has on moderate and severe damage blast effect that, by the way, also drops peer markers on the enemy. The natural playstyle with Kairis 2 is that you sit behind a wall on a peer marker next to a flameborn model that you can burst over the damage from because she has a very interesting ability scourging radiance when this model would suffer damage from burning during the end phase you may have another model within three inches suffer that damage instead and reduce the burning condition by that amount so you can easily send the damage to a flameborn model that is immune to burning but then on turn two she wanted her to be the last model to activate so you can fly across that wall and straight into the midst of the enemy, wreck havoc by flying around in circles, dealing damage to multiple models, dropping peer markers, and then in the end phase, send all of her burning damage to one of the enemy models. But a trick that I like is actually activating Kairis first in the turn, or well, somewhere first, quite early in the game, when their timing window looks nice. And then send her into the mist, dropping a lot of peer markers here and there, and just wrecking havoc, and then flying off in some strange direction. And then, as turn goes on, I want Deacon Hellcrist to be the last model to activate. He has manipulative, by the way, so you probably want him to activate last anyways. The thing with Kairis is that when she attacks and when she starts to hit in close combat, she's flying around in all kinds of circles. And with her 7 move and her rampage 5 inch move, and because she can charge as much as you want, she can end up in lots of different strange positions across the map. And then, with the Hellcrist, Translocate Ritual that requires a tome, but once he has three or more burning from Burning Man's Gift, you will always have the inbuilt suit. You can move Kairis onto a model where you want her to get the Scourging Radiance trigger at the end phase. This is a great way of solving that death ball problem and have more of a global reach on the battlefield. So let's talk more specifically Deacon Hellcrist. He's a very tanky model with a manipulative ability making your opponents get minus flips and the Blaze of Glory ability giving you bonus flips if you have enough burning on your defensive duels if you want to. So he can be very tricky to deal with. But also, he usually has shielded because of the spirits in the flame, as well as he has that 
self-heal that will give him burning, and we talked about that one before. The only ability that I don't like on him is his demise ability, where he dies, he explodes, dealing two damage, and deals burning. Never really does anything against my opponents, only at myself, because... I usually have him in the back end as a utility model with his range attack and his ability to translocate models around depending on where I need models to be. But the big reason you play him and sometimes I would even say that he's out to include is because of the flared up. The burning condition cannot be ended or reduced on models within 6 inches by enemy effects. This is key if you're gonna have a chance against some crews. There are of course counters to the counter, sometimes people use lure to drag your models out of position and then you're outside of his aura and you can remove the burning condition etc. However there are counters to the counter counter, you can use translocation ritual to bring back the model to safety or other tricks. Now protecting the burning condition becomes really important when you have a model like the fire golem that have a really interesting ability, flaming body. When this model suffers damage, it may reduce the value of its burning condition by up to 2, reduce damage it suffered by an equal amount. You could basically say that burning condition becomes something of its health points as well. And it's really easy to get something like 5 burning or more on this model, and you can gain more burning during the game, and you can heal it with your firebrands. So, in the end, this is a really tanky model. But once again, you really need to protect that burning condition, because if you don't have any burning at all, it's a... 5 defense, 10 health model that will honestly die quite fast once your opponents are starting to shop on it. The fire golem is truly an amazing model that you try to include in every single game if you can, if it fits. Now, one thing in Malifaux is that the one player that takes the most walk actions are usually the one losing the game. So you're usually trying to s figure out tricks on how you can move your models with bonus actions or how other models can move other models to save walk actions so you can do more attack actions because the more attack actions the easier you have of winning the match now the fire golem has an amazing inbuilt bonus action draw of flame with an eight inch reach place this model into base contact with the target only target friendly models here and you move burning up to three from that model to the fire golem so this can remove burning condition from models that might have too much burning condition that they start to take damage and you can basically self heal here a bit. So a classic opener here guys, we deploy standard deployment, we begin by activating Deacon Hellcrist, move action, walking forward on the battlefield and then bonus action, creating that peer marker and then basically take a focus, gains more burning, gains shielded and then we activate the fire golem, draw off flame to teleport onto that Deacon Hellcrist, gaining his burning and gaining some burning standing on the peer marker. Here from we can focus potentially on the fire golem to gain more burning as it's standing on the peer marker and then make a walk action or whatever we want to do here. Well, we have some other hit and run cool tricks as well. So in this example, we're standing behind a building and we have Seamus can't see us because of building blocking line of sight, but we can make a walk action. So now we can see Seamus and we can do that fire to flame tornado on the clumped up enemies. And then afterwards, you can do draw off flame to jump back to Deacon Hellcrist that had some burning and now your opponents can't see you anymore, which means that you can move forward and attack and then run the back and your opponents can't attack you. The fire golem can also transport peer markers by making walk actions, but it's a rather expensive model to do that. Now I try to avoid making as much walk actions as possible with this because I rather use its flaming fist, charge action, focus or flame tornado on it. But a model that is really good at moving around peer markers are fire gamin. It's just a four soul stone model that is quite tanky because of that flaming body and it has a range attack that is mediocre. It's actually something that does harm when your opponents have suddenly gained some injured. But the big thing here is that dance in flames that if you take a walk action with it, you can move that peer marker. So this is a 
sheep model that could transform into a scheme runner that is just bringing peer markers that you leave behind with you. This is helping you use the future peer markers that you create more aggressively forward while the fire gammon is helping you bring the previously ones with you forward. I usually include just one fire gaming with the sole intent of transporting peer markers. We have already mentioned Carlos capabilities of producing peer markers, but he has a bigger role in my opinion, scheme runner. This is a really expensive scheme runner, eight soul stones, he's a henchman, so you can use soul stones on him as well, but he's extremely mobile. The dance of flame, this model gains burning and may move five inches, means that you can make an interact action then uses bonus action to move 5 inches and then make another interact action again. He's also really slippery. With his butterfly jump and his don't mind me, he's really tricky to actually catch and hold. As you attack him, he runs off further into the enemy deployment zone or you engage him and he just walks out there with ease. By the way, you remove him from combat with a bonus action and you just make a normal walk action and then interact or something of the sort. Now he is one of the more expensive scheme runners, but in my experience he is a tricky one to deal with. Your opponents often have to use more resources, more soul stone models, more expensive models to shut him off being able to run into the enemy deployment zone. But he's not a durable model and he's not great at fighting. If you send him to the forefront and try to like fight with him, he usually ends up dying. But a model that absolutely refused to die is Elijah Borgman. This guy has Promise to the Flame, which means he has armor once he's close to a peer marker. He has Blaze of Glory, which means that you can use Burning Condition to get bonus flips in duels, so he's really defensive there as well, and aggressive as well. He has a bonus action called to the Burning Man, which is a self heal, he gains burning, burning that he can use for bonus flips, but also he could pulse out burning to your allies. Now, of course, you're gonna say enemies, but I usually use that ability Ignite to give burning to my allies. He has a great sword, so he's very hard hitting as well. In my opinion, this guy is an absolute monster. His only real problem is that he's quite slow. You often have to make walk actions with him to move forward. You really have to move from peer marker to peer marker and you have to like walk towards your opponent. So there's that. He doesn't really do anything in the early game. He starts doing something in turn two or turn three. So I often use him as a counter attack model. I place him in a key position and if an opponent overextends, goes towards my model, I can use this to counter charge and basically hit back because he synergizes greatly with firebrands. I often have Elijah hanging around close to my firebrands to protect them, might be even the wall in front of the firebrands and the firebrands can then heal on Elijah. But firebrands are absolutely amazing. I often include a minimum of two and sometimes even three. It never feels wrong including three of them actually. Some of you might say that you can't really outrange some of the opponents that you have, but I would say that sometimes you actually can because they are so durable that they can sit there and take the heavier shots from opponents while shooting back at the opponents with a little bit of a weaker fire. But their shooting isn't that terrible. The fire starter is a really different model compared to the other crew. He's a very mobile model with flight, seven moves, so he's a good scheme runner, especially with reckless, as he can make free actions so you can move him 14 inches and then take an interact action. That is actually quite good. But honestly, it kind of stops there. Well, he is that seven move inch reckless scheme runner, I guess. But with his really short range attack and no durable abilities, no promise to the flame and no blaze of glory means that if you send him forward to shoot at your opponents, your opponents usually kill him when they fire back. The best use I've ever had with him is having him hang back behind a wall so no one can see him, no one can shoot at him. And then suddenly you fly forward, you shoot and then use Reckless to fly back, doing that hit and run where your opponents are never able to actually attack this thing. The problem here is that you still, that is an eight inch reach, but on the other hand, you have seven moves, you can fly quite far forward from that wall and then shoot eight inches and then fly back. And here you are very protected, but that is really terrain dependent strategy. But you could use other models to 
build a wall. You can use the fire golem, Elijah Borgman, and you stand strictly straight behind them. It could fail if some of them die or if opponents are able to lure away, get the opponent models out of position. So you suddenly reveal this guy, but you could use your allied models as a wall to fly forward, shoot, and then fly back if you want to do that kind of hit and run strategy, because his shooting attack is actually pretty decent overall. Then we have Iggy. This is a Vow minion, so he has the mystery and opportunist burning. So whenever something gets burning within six inches, he will take a damage once each activation. Now that is a very death ballist strategy, and sometimes death balling too much is bad because sometimes your opponents are spreading out and you want to run around and catch them. But on the other hand, if your opponents are death balling back to you, then this is actually a great model because having that aura, your opponents are just slamming into you, you're having that wall of models, that fire golem, that Elijah Borgman that takes the hits, and having this guy sitting back, dealing mystery damage, and then he activates charge forward, punch, punch, reckless, punch a third time. But how I mostly use him is as a scheme runner or an anti-scheme model. With his Arisen ability, you can destroy your opponent's scheme markers, make them explode, but also with that reckless, you can move a potential 15 inches or 10 inches and then interact. Because he is manipulative, he's also quite durable, so he functions pretty decent as a scheme runner. But honestly, I don't play this model that much. Carlos is a much better scheme runner, and the crew is still really good at killing stuff in its death ball capabilities without Iggy. But then we have some other out of keyword models that I think we should take a look at. A specific one in regard to our main problem, the part where we need to produce a lot of peer markers so we can spread out and don't move too much as a death ball. Here we have Bretonia Lola that is also a Cassandra Belton. Now the big trick here is the upstage ability. Upstage reads, once per activation select one of the target's tactical actions that does not attach an upgrade or list a model by name friendly only this model may take the selected action. Now strangely here, you're allowed to take bonus actions and I don't know if this is intended, if have a feeling it's gonna be nerfed, but well, it's one of the few abilities that can actually make secondary bonus actions of other models. This means that we can make carries on the peer bonus action with an inbuilt tome where you only need to flip a five or greater. If you flip a mask, you may take the swift trigger to take this action again. So we can use this Cassandra Felton, the Bretonia Lola here in this case, to basically make more peer markers. Similar to how Deacon Hellchrist and Kairis Reborn 2 could spread out and go in two different directions with this, this pair can do the same thing. Or well, not too much apart, you still need to be within 8 inches for it to work. But she also has Don't Mind Me and Nimble, so you can use walk actions as a bonus action, so you can do walk, walk, and then still do upstage on the pier, or you do on the pier, walk and charge, so she has a lot of actions on her for, a, in this case, 9 soulstone model. We can take this to a second level, here is Sundeep Font of Magic, version 2. He has a very interesting ability, Etheric Control. You may choose to create ice pillar markers, peer markers or scrap markers, but in this case we're gonna create peer markers. He can create three, or well actually he can create five shockwave peer markers each turn cycle. Three from one of his activations and then, then there's another trick with Banasuva. But he can mass produce peer markers for you. And, by the way, Caris being the crew leader, those peer markers will deliver injured. So, you're attacking your opponents with shock waves, you're attacking your opponents with peer markers and I give burning to them, and you're attacking your opponents with injured as well. Sandeep, Font of Magic, doesn't need to take a single walk action himself, because he also has that moment of reflection, which means that he can make small, tiny moves on his own, totally a 4 inch move each activation or you can move other models as well he can also heal stuff so but there's another cool synergy here whenever an elemental takes the concentrate action within six inches of him you may move a marker within three inches of 
that model so you can move peer markers here's the thing when a peer marker moves it will trigger its hazardous terrain trait so you can move a peer marker that's standing on an enemy model to give that enemy model injured and burning but specifically injured here but he is really great with carries because he helps producing a lot of peer markers you can spread out a lot on the map but also really attack your opponents with a lot of shock waves but also move peer markers around to give injured but also bring peer markers with you forward on the battlefield here's an example of one of my favorite crews with carries and sandeep banasuva three firebrands a fire gammon to help transport that peer marker forward but sometimes I'd rather have a big fire golem instead of Banasuva because that fire golem can be so extremely tanky. But if I'm doing carries too, I usually skip the fire golem completely. I go Elijah Borgman, Carlos and Deacon Hellchrist. Still though, three firebrands and a fire gammon feels really core for the crew. I really like short and fast compact videos and I try to compress the information as much as I could in this video only talking about the most important things. Still though, I think this video became one of the longer ones that I usually make. So if you have any comments or questions, feel free to leave those in the comments below and I will try my very best to answer those questions. Take care guys, thank you so much for watching.